Father, you're, you're so wonderful. I bless your name. You're holy. You're holy, Lord. You're wonderful. I ask you, precious Holy Spirit, to anoint me with your power that I might deliver Jesus and that you would install inside of each life right here, right now. You would install yourself into each one of us, God. Thank you for your mighty presence. Thank you for your wonderful, wonderful mercy. Without your mercy, Lord, we're nothing. We understand, Lord, that you've been so gracious because we deserve nothing. So, Lord, let your mercy rest upon us and show us your mighty son. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to talk to you about mysticism. I want to talk to you about what it is for the soul to ascend into God. We're not going to talk about things that have to do horizontally at all. Those things are all necessary. Those things are all great. We're not even going to look at those things. We're going to look at vertical completely. Okay? So everything I say is going to be vertical only. We're not talking about burden prayer for the lost. We're not talking about changing things in the city. We're not talking about doing things for God. We're going to talk about directly ascending to God internally. That's what we're going to talk about. Because I have seen this. I have seen people get touched by God. Sincerely, truthfully, completely, radically changed. And then as time goes on and, and time starts going, they, they start to pedal a little slower and before you know it, they stop and then they get off the bike and before you know it, they're in a store somewhere. The bike is just, they're not progressing anymore at all. And these are people that you didn't point your finger at at one time and say, oh, that guy, I don't know, he's not going to make it, he's compromised. No, these are people that you looked at and said, that guy's going to shake the world, man. There's only one thing that's going to sustain us. It's not preaching the gospel. It's not praying for the lost. It's not praying about things. It's not trying to get God to look at stuff. It's looking at God. It's stopping the gaze that's horizontal and fixating your soul to gaze vertical. We're talking about the soul ascending to God. That's what we're talking about. This is the only thing that is going to last in the sense of longevity in the Christian life. You can pray with the greatest burden that there ever was on the planet, and then a month later, be completely backslidden. But you cannot ascend into God and have him come inside of you and find a union with him and backslide. Because the protection in life is God himself. We can know everything there is in the scriptures. When we preach on the street, we meet people that know the Bible better than us. But they don't know God, man. I actually went through a season in my life where I exchanged the word of God or the God of the word with the word of God. I eclipsed Jesus with the scriptures. And I began to stare at a book and worship a book and spend time with a book instead of knowing a person. Because all these things that have to do with knowing this person happen internally. It has to do with the ascension of the soul up into the spirit man. These things are high. These things are deep. These things are so simple that people look right past them. The simplicity and purity of devotion to Jesus Christ is life. Everything outside of that will fall away. Now listen. Don't fall into the trap right now of saying, I love Jesus. I know exactly what you're talking about. I want to present to you and submit to you that there's so much deeper to go in this person of Jesus Christ. In whom are all the riches 
of wisdom and knowledge in life. Jesus is inexhaustible and our love for him is all consuming to the point that when a man really encounters God and God begins to come inside of the man, what happens is God begins to come out of the man and the man begins to look like God. Mysticism is this. It is the inward ascent of the soul into God. We're talking about melting into God. We're talking about being so in the fire that you melt away completely. And our prayers are simply this, God, burn me away. Burn me away. We're talking about moving away from be, uh, being a doer of things, being a doer of things for God, and becoming an instrument through which God does his things. I think I told you guys this before, that when God says, send, pray that the laborers will be sent forth, his definition of laborers is far different than ours. Our definition is who will do the work. God's definition is this. Who are those through whom I can do my work? Jesus said in John 14, 10, he said, my father does his works through me. This is becoming a conduit. We want to be pipes, man. We want to be people that get out of the way so God is completely free to get in the way. We're wanting God to flow through, right? What happens is, is this, that when the solical man has not ascended into God, we begin to operate in the solical realm where everything is scattered and confused and it gets real heavy and burdensome and you get tired and you don't wait on God and you get really wasted and you burn out. But they that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength, right? They will mount up with wings as eagles. Listen, waiting on God transforms you from a human into being a man in whom God dwells. You know, there are three races on the earth. First Corinthians, uh, I think it's 11.30 or 10.30, talks about the three races on the earth. There's the Jew, the Gentile, and the Christian. Why? Because we're a brand new species, man. Why? Because when God indwells the soul, the life of God and the soul of man, we become something that has never been on this planet before. Right? Because we look like Jesus. Jesus is the firstborn among many brethren. We're talking about being sons of God. Listen, this reality of being a son is so far beyond comprehension, all the study in the world will never bring you to it. Man, you can know Genesis to Revelation and still never be a son of God. Because being a son of God has nothing to do with the knowledge of black and white. It has to do with the inward ascent of the soul into God. It has to do with being melted away so that the only thing that exists anymore is God himself. This is what we want. We want to be representations of God himself in the earth. Listen, I was reading a, a, um, an old mystic the other day, and he talked about the four levels of love. Listen to this. Listen to how potent and powerful this is. He said the first level of love, and I want you to think about all the people you know that aren't even walking in this first level of love, Okay? That call themselves Christians. He said the first level of love is thirst for God. And how many people do you know they're salivating for God? And I want God. How many people genuinely on the inside are thirsting for the most high God? It's very rare. Why? Because their thirst is being fulfilled by other things. Listen, whatever you thirst, whatever you choose to quench your thirst with is what you're worshiping. So worship is the soul's attempt to find the quenching of its thirst. And whatever you allow to satisfy the longing of the soul outside of God has been deified in your life. First level of love for God is thirst. God, I thirst you in a dry and weary land where there is no water, right? Second level is coming to God. Because there's some people that are thirsty, but they don't allow the thirst to work for them. Proverbs says this, that the hunger of a man will work for him. The thirst needs to get to the spot where it drives you to find him. And when it moves to that point, you've moved to the next level of love. For God. Remember, because we're only talking vertically, not talking horizontally. 
first thing is thirsting for God, but it needs to overtake you to the point where it drives you to find him. The third level is this. First one, thirst for God. Second one, it's coming to God. The third one is coming into God. When you start to come to God, you start to exchange prayer times for meeting with God. You start to meet, man, you start to meet the Holy Ghost. And he becomes a living reality. And you go inside of him. And then your love has went higher than just coming to God. First level is I thirst for you. The second level is I come to you. The third level is I'm inside of you. You know what the fourth level is? Looking like God. So you'll find that the one that looks like God on the earth, who looked like God the most on the earth? Jesus. Why? Because he was the exact representation of the Father. Why? Because he loved the Father more than any human has ever loved the Father. You will mirror the image of God in the earth to the degree that you love him. And you fail to look like God to the degree that you fail to love him. When we fail to love God with everything that we are, we rob him of the reward of his sufferings. When God subjected himself to becoming a fetus inside of a woman, that was the most humbling thing that has ever been performed in the history of time. God himself who holds the whole world together, God himself who set the stars in their places, God himself who sustains all things by the power of his word, God himself who is the author and holds the ever-expanding universe, subjected himself to coming inside of a woman and being a fetus. What kind of a God is that, man? Not only that, but when he comes out, he is a God who has restricted himself to the frailty and the restrictions of a human body. My God, you want to talk about love. He subjected himself to humanity. And then what does he do? Takes it even further. If he stopped there, that'd be the greatest thing that was ever done and ever will be done. Period. But he didn't. Then he gave himself to be beaten by his creation. Plucked, beard, mocked. Scourge gave his back wounds on his back. The back of God? The blood of God? My God, the blood of God. The blood of what kind of a God allows himself to bleed to, to save rebellious, sinful mockers? There's no greater love than that. There is no greater humility than this. And I'll tell you this. Jesus did this out of love for his father. Yeah? Listen to this. Then he's killed. He resurrects the glory, right? He wins everything. Across the board, he's 100% won. Across the board, wisdom too high for mankind. It's an octave too high for your mental capacity. You just can't hear it. And it takes supernatural enablement to be able to even grasp it. Otherwise, like a guy said to me at UCF the other day, he said, you guys believe in stupid fairy tales. That's what it is. It's a fairy tale to them. Because you need the spirit to make it known, right? So, get, getting back to the original point is this. You will look like God who suffers gladly for his God, Jesus, God, God suffers he gives himself he works miracle power he is the embodiment and representation of god's character power and life in a human body right in the exact proportion to his love for god the father's obsessed with the son the son is obsessed with the father there is a seamless unity between the two and this jesus is all in all to the father but to Jesus, the Father is all in all. This, I tell you, is 
mysticism where the soul totally no longer exists for itself, but has given itself to ascend up to God so that God himself is all in all. So this course, these five weeks, the last week, a guy named Michael Koulianos is going to be here, and he's, we're just going to do it as a ministry time. He's got a ministry here called Jesus Image. He's carrying the glory of God on his life. He's going to come, and he's going to bless you guys on the last week. But listen closely. This is the introduction of what we will be talking about the next couple weeks. I'll tell you, mysticism has been so, so misconstrued and twisted. It's very sad. The first one, first thing I want to talk about, the, the, this will be this one, which is an introduction to what we're going to be talking about. Then I want to talk about inflow, overflow, outflow. You need an inflow if you're going to have an overflow. And you need an overflow to get an outflow, right? This and nothing else is Christianity. If you have an outflow, if you have an outflow that is not in exact proportion to your inflow, you will die spiritually. If you are looking to have an outflow when you have no overflow, you're deceiving yourself. You feel me? So we need, first of all, above all things, an inflow of God, right? And this really is the only thing that you need to do. You have one task. Listen, hear me. You have one thing that you have to do. You don't have to pray for the lost. You don't have to preach the gospel. You don't have to go out and do all these things. Why? Because those are outflows. You have to sit at the feet of Jesus and learn how to ascend into him and then effortlessly the fruit will be born. You can go ahead and try to pin fruit on the tree if you want to. But as soon as the wind blows, it's all coming down, brother. But if you'll let your heart focus on receiving the sap, and that's it, just receive the sap, your fruit will effortlessly come out. And you know what it will actually be? It will be God working through you. And you will look like Jesus who said, my father performs his works through me. John 14, 10, one of the greatest scriptures I've ever read in my life. The um, second class I wanna talk to you about is prayer, the application of the heart to God. Meditation, the, the third class, I wanna talk about meditation, receiving God into yourself, waiting on the Lord. These things, are very important. And I'd also like to touch on asceticism. If you don't know what that is, it's, it's, like the, uh, it's like practices of separating the body from the soul. Because I don't know about you, but your body is hanging on to your soul, and it's very heavy. And the only way for that soul to go up into the spirit man and be dominated by the spirit life, Paul said, what if you walk in the spirit, you will not gratify the desires of sinful nature. He didn't say you might not. He didn't say you have a good chance not, he said, you will not. Why? Because if you understand what I'm talking about by receiving an inflow, then you'll have an overflow and it'll create an outflow. If you take what I'm saying to you right now and allow the spirit to dominate your inner man, then you will have fruit and you will not sin. We're not talking about sinless perfection because everybody works the process out. And everybody's in a continual mastering of this process. And really, you're not going to master it in this life. But you can get as close as you can because your reward in the age to come will be in exact proportion to how close you got to looking like Jesus. I want to talk to you about asceticism, which is that. Fasting, vigils, solitude, the detached life, those wonderful things. That people look at and they say, that's religious. It is religious if... You're not doing it out of love for Jesus, man. It is religious if you're not doing it with the focus of the spirit man reaching down through the soul to take the body by control and say, down. Spirit man runs things. If you fast from the soul, it will be terrible for you. Absolutely terrible. It's no fun. Because you don't see Jesus when you do it like that. You see yourself. You get very pride prideful. 
You say, look at what I've done. That's, and you want to tell everybody. Because why? You're from the soul. The soul is like, I fasted 30 days. When the spirit man is in control, he reaches down through the soul, he grabs a hold of the body, commands it to go down. Bam. Then he grabs the soul on his way back up and he pulls it into God. This man starts to look like Jesus. You can tell because he's so humble and he's broken because he understands that he can't do it. He's got to get out of the way. You'll never graduate from dependency. You will never graduate from dependency. You will never graduate from dependency. And if you do, you exited the school. You dropped out. Because dependency is the way into God. Dependency is the way for God to blow on you and you move. Independence will kill you. Say all this to say that what we're talking about here today and what we will be talking about is this. Distinguishing between dependency and independency because a lot of people do things independently that look like dependency, but it's all about me. We want to we ascend into God. The last class is what Michael will take, and it has to do with divine life, bearing the image of Jesus Christ. Because the inflow is wonderful. It creates an overflow. And that creates an outflow. And it is not until there's an outflow that you actually look like Jesus. Because you can have a great inflow. But if you don't allow it to overflow, then you never feel his feelings. Let me, let me explain to you what the, the overflow is. The inflow is the soul ascending into God. It is the practice of coming to God and yielding and surrendering in worship and stillness, stopping the soul and allowing the spirit to dominate you and receiving his word and his life and himself into you. Madame Guyon said this, God desires above all things to speak himself into you. T. Austin Sparks said this, when God speaks, he speaks himself when God speaks, he speaks himself, and when he speaks to you, he puts himself in you. That's how it is. That's how you become like Jesus. There's no other way. You have to hear God. He's made it like this so that you can't come up with a formula. You need him. You can come up with a formula if you want and practice it as much as you want, but God ain't speaking to you. You can find great revelation in the scriptures that, that you feel is, is from God or, or listen to teacher. Great. But if you're not hearing God, you're not being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ because there's only one way to look like the word is for the word to come inside of you. And that only comes by waiting. And waiting is getting out of the way. Jesus said, John 8, 28, I, listen to this, I do nothing on my own initiative. Man, what kind of a life is that? I don't even take an initiative. I get out of the way and the glory takes me. I'm a glory writer. That's what I want. I want to ride the glory because it's way more fun because the ecstasies of God are for us because God above all things, listen closely, God above all things wants to satisfy you with himself. And as a matter of fact, there's nothing in this life that can satisfy an ounce like God himself because you were made to have God come inside of you. That's what you were made for. And there's nothing else that will satisfy the longings of the soul than God himself. And I tell you this, man is an endless succession of cravings. He wants a job. He wants friends. He wants a social life. He wants to be uh, looked at. He wants to be esteemed. He wants to write a book so everybody will know his name. He wants all these things because Adam loves himself. Who's Adam? Adam is the man who set this whole thing in motion. Adam is you. Adam is me. Adam's got to go. Only one way for Adam to be destroyed is for Christ to reign. Some people try to put Adam down in order to get Christ to reign. It'll never work. You get Christ to reign and then Adam gets destroyed. You cannot kill the flesh to get to God. You go to God and he kills the flesh. Romans 8, 11. if you put to death by the Spirit, how do you do it? By the Spirit. How do you get the Spirit to work? Well, you let the soul ascend to it. How? 
A.W. Tozer said this, faith is the inward gaze of the soul upon God. Right? It's good stuff. I don't even know where I was going. But here's the thing. This is where we're going to go. It's going to be amazing. Oh, yeah, I was talking about the ecstasies of God. Listen, therefore, every one of you, don't let anybody tell you. Listen, I've been told this my whole Christian walk. My whole Christian walk. I got saved in 97 in the Browns Revival, got rocked by Jesus Christ, repented of my sins, and didn't go back. Ever since then, God came inside, and things have been different. There's been ups and downs, but he's been faithful all the way, even though I've been unfaithful. He's been faithful. And I still love him. He takes me deeper in his love the more that I see how much I don't deserve his love. Did you catch that? When you understand really how much you don't deserve his love, then you're able to love him more. Why? Because he who's forgiven much loves much. What does that mean? Does that mean the guy that killed 10 guys loves more than the guy who killed two? No, it's the guy that understands Adam the most. When he understands what he actually is in and of himself, he's then able to see how much God had to really love him to come and die for him. And then by that revelation, he's infilled with the love of God. Why? Because we said, you can't understand Jesus came and coming to die. You can't understand God becoming a man without the Holy Ghost. And the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. Right? So the revelation of God, greater love hath no man than this, puts you in connection with we love him because he first loved us. And this stuff is so powerful. It's, God is just, it, it's, it's just ridiculous. The scriptures are absolutely ridiculous. Why? Because they're encrypted. You understand that? The, the Bible's encrypted. I had a dream one time, a big Bible just like mine, and I had opened it up, and it was in letters I don't understand. The whole thing. I'm like, man, this whole thing is, I don't understand a word. I don't even understand one letter. Let me tell you something. The Bible's encrypted. And until his presence comes upon you, you cannot see. Psalm 73, what happens? It says, then I entered. I, I sought to understand these things. And then he said, then I entered the sanctuary of the Most High. And what happened? I perceived. How do you perceive the nearness of God? What happened in Luke 24? They're walking down the road with Jesus, right? And I used to read the scripture like this. They, he expounded to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. Okay? I used to look at it like that. So we've got to run to the scriptures to find the things about Jesus. But then the Holy Spirit quickened it for me one day. And he showed me it's not that way. Because he decoded it. When it's coded... You see that you run to the Bible to find God. But when it's unlocked, you see that he expounded to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. The presence of God will open your eyes. Without the presence, your eyes are closed. It's period. That's just how it's going to be. I say all that to say, it's only in the practice of melting into God that we find the sustaining power to always progress in God. Because if you can think of a time when you love Jesus more, then in a sense you're backslidden. Because we're supposed to be progressing forward. We should be being ever consumed with his love. There's a reason why God's called an all-consuming fire. Because he consumes everything, right? And if he's really there, you will die. Okay, let me define what true mysticism is. Miss, mama, Jesus, I thank you for your glory. Lord, don't let any of these words, Lord, fall on deaf ears. Speak them to me fresh, Lord. I need to know you more. I want to drown in you, Jesus. I want your love to make me soft, tender, and just like you. I want the Holy Ghost, God. Dominate me. Be my continual habitation. Let me be your habitation. Dwell in me and I in you, God. Jesus. True mysticism is this. To say true mysticism will imply that there's a false. Okay? There's other religions that practice mystical things, but they stop short. Okay, I'll show you how. Buddhists practice mysticism by stilling the soul, which is awesome. But they stop short. Because we don't still the soul, just still the soul. You still the soul to give it to God. Right? I want you to picture, can I see that cup? Is there something in there? Well, pretend that cup is right here, okay? And it's spinning all over the place, just like a dancing, lively cup. And you're sitting there, and you're trying to fill it up with water. You're like, dude, this is not possible. Because it's dancing, you don't know where it's going to go next, right? 
But if you stop the cup, it sits still. And it's no longer scattering and scattered, right? That's what the Buddhists do. They still their soul. They stop the thinking, the, the desires. They stop everything. And they find Zen. They find a peace. Why? Because the soul got stopped. Your soul is full of confusion and running all over the place. And if you can stop the soul, you'll find a level of stillness in your life. And they do. I mean, look at them. They really believe. But here's the thing. That's not what we want. We want peace that passes all understanding from the Prince of Peace. So we stop the cup so that he can fill it up. So we stop the soul so that God can flow. So this is what we want to do. Still the soul. Let me tell you the biggest secret that I've found in, in mystical living and things pertaining to divine union. Man, things pertaining to divine union. Okay? People don't know how to stop their souls. People, listen to me, people fail to experience God to the degree that they don't stop their soul. Their souls are all over the place, man. They're, they're flipping around and jumping around and they wonder why they're not being filled up with God. And they wonder, you start talking to them about the ecstasies of God and they're like, dude, what are you even talking about? What do you mean ecstasies of God? The only time they ever experienced something is when they got taken over by a Benny Hen praying for him or something. That's the only time they've actually experienced something. And then they go, to a, they go to a meeting and some man who's filled with the Holy Ghost because he stopped his soul and the Holy Ghost filled him up and he's got an overflow that creates an outflow. He touches you and his outflow blows you over and your cup is just knocked down on the ground. And then you're like, holy moly, this is amazing. And then you go jumping from conference to conference to get blown over. But God, all the while, is not satisfied with that because he still doesn't have you. He's just touching you. He touches you so that you can touch him. Right? So what God wants is this. He wants you. And the way that you give to him isn't just stand in the center of a room and say, God, here I am. You don't give yourself to God by spending time with a book. You don't give yourself to God by going to all the meetings or going to the street. You don't give yourself yourself to God any of those ways because you can do all those things and still be operating out of the soul dominion there's only one way to do it and he made it this way on purpose so that you have to be absolutely and completely dependent upon him and you can't make a form right so here's the thing how are you going to do it the soul has got to get still and then it's got to be offered to the Lord in worship and then, matter of fact, let me, just, let me just give it to you like this. You guys know Psalm 36 verse 8? Scripture says this. He gives us to drink from the river of his delights. You guys ever read that scripture? I want you to picture something with me. There's a river right here flowing with water. And this river is God himself because A.W. Tozer said this. God is a shoreless sea of pleasure. And think about that. The absolute fulfillment of everything that you desire in life is found in one person. God himself, right? And he's this river of delights. Not a good time. No, we're talking about delights. We're talking about God himself making joy, peace, and absolute pleasure inside of you. Inside of your soul, right? He gives you to drink. What does that mean? It means he gave you a pass. It is yours to drink from the river of delights anytime you want to. And like I was going to say before that I forgot, I'm going to say it right now, don't let anybody tell you that you will go through a time when God will not allow you to be satisfied with him. My God, that is a devil trap. Just for somebody to look at you and say, oh, he's in the honeymoon stage and that's going to end. You point at that dude and you say, dude, you need to come back to Jesus, bro. Because my God is a shoreless sea of pleasure. Because in the presence of the Lord is fullness of joy and pleasure forevermore. What does that mean? Forevermore means all the time. He gives you to drink from the river of his delights. What does this mean? He's given you a pass to come and drink from the river of delight anytime you want to. 
I used to work construction, and it would be 97 degrees outside, and we had to dig 3,000 feet of a trench and then knock the, the posts into the ground, and I'm working with a bunch of heathen devils that don't know Jesus, and I'm in charge. So you, you tell me how that went. It didn't go very well. We're sweating like crazy. It's going to take hours. There's no sight of end, and it's terrible to the flesh. The flesh doesn't like it at all. But I'll tell you this. I have a pass where I can drink from the river of his delights any time that I want to. So what do I do? As I'm digging amidst the heathen and I'm pulling this trenching shovel out of the ground and digging grass out of the ground and I'm hot and I'm tired and I might be on a fast, so I'm really tired. All I do is say this. I still my soul. Because you don't have to get still physically to still the inside. I'm working, and I give him everything I am. I say, Lord, I give you, I give you all that I am. Everything I am, I give to you. I worship you. I stop all my desires, all my thinking, all my reasoning. I stop it all because I have control to do that. Because God has given it to me. And I worship him. And the 97, 95 degrees heat and the task at hand become absolutely irrelevant to me because I've been overtaken with delight. Or I've had times, I was working in a body shop one time, a uh, auto place where you take your car to get fixed. And these guys had a section and they had porn pictures, I don't know how they did it, but they had pictures from the top to the bottom, of just, just girls, all up and down the wall, and I had to go in there and clean, and when I would go in there, the body and the soul desire is to receive a gratification from the gate into my soul, let me tell you something, that's a love affair against God, the soul desires that, and to give myself to getting pleasure from that is like kissing another woman when I'm married. Because my soul is having an affair. Because there's only one person that is to satisfy my desires. That is God himself. So I have an affair on God. Spiritual adultery. I add mixture to my life. If I look at those things, the lust in my heart. So what do I do? I drink from the river of the lights, so those pictures become just pictures. They're no longer women, they're just pictures. Not that I can look at them, but I, they're irrelevant to me because I'm satisfied. So I worship Jesus and I still my soul and let him fill my cup and the pictures become nothing to me and I'm able to go in there and remain pure, spotless and blameless because I'm absolutely satisfied because let me give you a definition of holiness that God himself gave me when I was driving in Germany in a taxi cab. I was driving there and I, I, I was thinking to myself, Lord, I worship you, I honor you, I adore you and he spoke to my soul a definition of holiness that if I was you, I would memorize it because it came straight from God. God does not speak to me word for word, barely ever in my life. He just gives me a feeling and I have to try to write down the words to give words to the feeling that I have in my spirit, man. But this was word for word, okay? One of the only times that I've ever had this in my life, he said this, Eric, holiness is being addicted to the maximum pleasure of life, which is God himself. What is holiness? It is being addicted to the maximum pleasure of life, which is God himself. How do I remain holy in an unholy atmosphere? I'm addicted to the maximum pleasure of life, which is God himself. Right? So let me just finish this up and then we'll, uh, then we'll quit. You have a pass. Okay? I want everybody to say, I got a pass. What is that pass? It's Psalm 36, verse 8. He has given you to drink from the river of his delights. Right? Now let me show you how to drink from the river of his delights. Really quickly, this, this, is, this, is, this is so precious that I wish somebody would have told me this. And my God, if somebody would have told me this, it would have it saved me. So much stuff. I wouldn't have fell into so many things just, you know, in life. I never fell away from God. But there's always the battles, the inward battles. So here's the thing. If somebody would have told me this, I could have found holiness a lot easier. 
Instead of pursuing holiness, I would have became holy. You understand? So listen to this. This is, this is how you drink from the river of his delights and find gratification in God that surpasses anything that this world can give to your body or your soul. Okay? If there's a river here, what practically is the first thing that I've got to do if I want to drink from that river? I've got to stop moving around. Right? Because how am I going to drink walking? If a river's right here and I got my pass and I take my pass and I'm looking at the river and I'm walking and I don't, I don't stay still, how in the world am I supposed to drink from the river? You got to stop. And man, that's a word for somebody in this place, man. Stop. Stop, 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 stop. You know one of the greatest things God ever said to me was this. Shh. And when you stop, then you're able to do something else. What is that? Stop. You want to drink from the river of his delights. So you stop. Then what do you do? You kneel. Worship him. Then as you're down, you're worshiping. Lord, I worship. I've stopped my soul. What does that mean? I stopped the thinking. I stopped my thoughts. I said, I'm not looking at anything. I give all my attention to you. All of it. I stop everything else and I look directly at you. And then I bow before you and I worship you. And of course, you don't have to physically do it. You internally worship him. And you worship him, and you say, Lord, I worship you. Now you're closer to the river, all right? As a matter of fact, you can't get to the river any other way than worship. So you worship, and worship is not a song. Worship is the inward gaze of the soul upon God. So I inwardly gaze upon him, and I, I, I do this all the time when I'm driving down the road or something. I say, Lord, I just, I can look at you. I look. And a lot of times in my prayer time, I find this. That the soul wants to get God to look at all kinds of stuff. Look at this guy. He did this to me. Or look at this project we got coming up. Or look at the lost over here. I, I don't want to do that anymore. Because I want to stop trying to get God to look at stuff and just look at God. Because you can't drink from the river of delights any other way. You can pray all day long for the lost. You'll never experience God. And only if you experience God can you really pray for the lost. Because when you experience God, then God begins to come inside. And what does God do? He makes you start feeling him. That's the overflow. The inflow is receiving God. The overflow is feeling like God. And the outflow is looking like God. Right? So check this out. I stopped. I got down and I worship him. Then what am I able to do? Then this is very, very important to experiencing God. I look at the river. What does that mean? I give attention to his presence. You have to give attention to the presence of God. What does that mean? Recognize his presence. And what does that mean? That means as you're worshiping him, there is an inward faculty that you've been given to just sense his nearness. So much so that David said the nearness of God is my good. You must worship and recognize his presence. Why? Because if worship doesn't transcend expression and become reception, it's worthless. You have to receive God into you. Expression is cool. But express in order to receive him. Because the only thing that pleases God is what he does himself. Period. Okay? Can't do anything to please God. You got to get out of the way and let him work and please himself. Okay? So, get down. You worship. Then what do you do? You give attention to his presence. I do this every morning of my life. I get up a few hours before I need to do anything else. And I spend the first hour, hour and a half, sometimes two hours, doing absolutely nothing but worship and drinking of his presence by recognizing him there, receiving him into myself, and just being satisfied with his nearness, waiting there, happily, completely satisfied with just him. And then, shows me where he wants to go. I don't wanna bring him a list and say this is where we're going. I wanna follow. I don't wanna step on his heels. I wanna follow him. And I want him to lead me. Because those that are led by the Spirit are the sons of God, right? This is sonship. It's 
through the practice of mysticism. Let me give you the definition of mysticism. Definition of mysticism is this. A mystic. It's one who seeks oneness with a deity through surrender. Man, whoever wrote that, if they weren't saved, they probably got saved when they wrote that. (laughs) Mystic is this. One who seeks oneness with a deity through surrender. And of course, our deity is the Son of God, Jesus Christ. We want to be one with Jesus, one with God, by his spirit. How do we do it? There's no other way than the practice of the inward melting into God or the soul ascending into God through these practices. So, Father, you are just, you're just absolutely amazing. And I thank you that you are dripping with anointing, God. I thank you that you are dripping with power. And in your mighty name, I ask you right now in, in, in this place that you would teach us to master the inner life for one sole purpose, Lord, being one with God. Become a, a conduit through which You can be yourself in the earth, O God. I need your glory, Lord. I need your glory. Your manifest presence. I ask you, make every person here within the sound of my voice a dripping, dipped in glory, revealer of the Son of God. In Jesus' name, protect us, God from just doing solically and may we be one with you and allow you to do through us in your precious name. Amen. Amen.